Last week on the show, we talked about how to follow the roadmap for effective pro-life conversations. Today, we're going to apply it to a couple different situations. Stay tuned. Hi, folks. My name is Cam. I am the host of the Pro-Life Guys podcast, a show dedicated to equipping you with the tools that you need to have compassionate and compelling conversations about abortion so together we can change minds, save lives, and transform our culture. Welcome back. Thanks a ton for joining the show. Before we dive into it, I just want to get a little quick thing off my chest here. Uh, we're going to do a full episode on this kind of thing um, coming up not too far from now, but on my drive into the office, um, I uh, listen to the radio and Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, commercial comes on the radio and I'm not going to get too far into Shoppers Drug Mart and all of their policies and all that kind of stuff, but it was yet another example of um, challenging the weightiness of abortion and birth control. And what I mean by that is that the commercial goes along the lines of, hey, did you know that Shoppers Drug Mart offers comprehensive birth control um, and a whole bunch of other things? Check out more at shoppersdrugmart.ca slash um, minor illnesses. They, they put birth control under minor illnesses. And this is certainly not the first time um, I have heard silly things like that. It is certainly not the first time that a major organization, company, corporation, whatever, um, has tried to mitigate the weightiness, the importance, the heaviness, whatever you want to call it, of pregnancy and welcoming children into our lovely world. And yet it just caught me and I feel like I, I should address this. I'm sure that there's other people who may have been listening to the radio before you turned on the podcast and may have heard something similar. We are going to do an episode on whether or not boycotts can be effective, how they can be effective, why they can be effective, why they could not be effective and how they cannot be effective at times. Um, and so that's not this episode, but I just wanted to get, kind of get that off my chest because I've heard it a whole bunch of times on the radio. I'm sure they've just tried to boost up their... Um, their advertising. I don't know if it's related to kids being back at school, which is kind of a, a dark, saddening kind of side of this that uh, maybe they're trying to play off of or what. I don't know exactly, but I just figured that I would get that off my chest. And um, I have the great privilege of hosting the podcast. And so apologies for anyone who didn't want to hear my ramble about <laughs> Shoppers Drug Mart and them categorizing birth control under minor illness mitigation and prevention. Um, Anyhow, that is not what today's episode is about. Today's episode is how are we applying the roadmap that we talked about last week. So for those new to the program, those that didn't tune in to last week's episode, I want to encourage you to hit pause right now. Check out last week's episode first. Um, here it is in a nutshell for those who did listen to it, but maybe you listened to this a few weeks after, a few months after, a few years after, who knows. Um, the mo the roadmap, um, roadmap for how to have effective conversation. It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't mean that you're going to change every single person's mind that you talk to. But what our stats have shown here in Western Canada, tracking just over 5,200 conversations with pro-choice minded people over the last two years. Um, so well over 5,000 conversations just with pro-choice people. We've already taken out the pro-life conversations. So over 5,000 conversations with people who started pro-choice in one way or another, supporting abortion either all the way through pregnancy for any reason or no reason, people who only supported it in cases of life of the mother or in cases of sexual assault, the whole spectrum of people who support abortion for one reason or another through some period of pregnancy. What we found is that close to 30% of people, when we're using this roadmap well, 30% of people become fully pro-life by the end of that conversation, and an additional 25% more becoming significantly more pro-life. What that means is that they've gone from um, supporting abortion through all nine months of pregnancy to, hey, I got to go, but you know what? I, I agree with you that this is barbaric in the third trimester and second trimester. It's only okay in the first trimester and I'll keep thinking about things. Or, you know what? I came into this conversation thinking abortion was okay for any situation. And now you're right. This is totally inappropriate for poverty or this or that, but I still think there's one or two cases, but I have to run to get back to class or get to work or something like that. Uh, these are people who are stating, you have changed my mind on the number of circumstances that abortion is appropriate for or the duration of pregnancy. 
in which I think that it's appropriate for. And so not a complete win, but moving in the right direction and getting them thinking very significantly about the issue. And so over 50% of people at the very least become significantly more pro-life, 25 to 30% of them becoming fully pro-life. And so this is why we're using the roadmap, because it helps not only the the people who do this day in and day out, but people maybe like yourself who are doing this on a weekly, maybe even a monthly basis. Um, and it's difficult to build up momentum that way at times. This is an approach that allows you to ensure the directionality of your conversation, ensuring, first of all, that you are demonstrating the empathy that we as pro-lifers have for mothers who are facing challenging pregnancies. Second of all, diving into the meat and potatoes of the pro-life worldview and the abortion conversation, which is the humanity of pre-born children. And third, if necessary, talking about the personhood of pre-born children and why all humans uh, must receive human rights and that human rights must begin when a human's life begins. And so those are the three steps. You empathize with hardship, you um, focus on the humanity and, and you convey the humanity. And then if necessary, you talk about the personhood and further clarification as to why all humans should get human rights. And so that sounds great in principle. I want to draw, dive through three examples of how this can be applied. And I do hope um, through this fall, I'm going to be working with my colleague, Quana, um, to do a few of these kind of mock dialogue um, back and forth while on a call like this. But for right now, I just want to walk through a few of them fairly slowly um, so that you can kind of have in your mind how this applies to what in my mind are three different kinds of abortion advocate arguments. They, they all get dealt with the same way. And so if these three kind of characteriz characterizations don't help you at all, then that's totally okay. Don't worry about remembering them. They're, <laughs> they don't change the conversations at all. Um, but I, I break them into three because I find that pro-lifers often respond to them differently before they have something like a roadmap. And so the first kind of abortion advocate defense um, is a mother-centric um, opinion. And so this is when a mother is living in poverty and her quality of life is going to decline. This is a mother who is um, in the midst of her education or, or advancing in her career. This is a mother who's been a victim of sexual assault. This is abortion is necessary for the sake of the mother. My, my mind, my eyes, my heart are towards the mother. I'm empathizing with her and therefore she needs to have abortion to be able to live a high quality of life. Um, I'm going to start with this kind because not only do I find that it's arguably the most common, but also because pro-lifers fall into um, the first major mistake here most frequently. This is the rebuttal area. Um, where we feel like we have to demonstrate how ridiculous, how arbitrary, how inappropriate their worldview is. We try to contradict it with statistics, with facts, with challenges as to whether or not they actually have a heart or whether they understand science. This is not rebuttal time. This is arguably the most important time to demonstrate that empathy. And so if somebody says to me, hey, I think abortion should be allowed when the mother has literally been sexually assaulted by a family member. This is literally incest of the highest degree. This is absolutely heinous. I can't believe that you would force a mother to go through pregnancy and parenting when she's undergone such a traumatic experience. That's something I'm sure many of us have heard um, or at the very least have seen online or other pro-abortion um, arguments. This is really important that we address and that we don't address it, like I said, with rebuttal. I don't care that the Guttmacher Institute suggests that less than 3% of abortions are performed on victims of sexual assault. Not only is that statistic bogus, because I have personally spoken to hundreds of victims of sexual assault, many of whom became pregnant through sexual assault, none of whom ever told any form of law enforcement of the trauma that they experienced, whether it was because they didn't want to have to relive it by going through the court system, whether it's because they had some form of Stockholm syndrome or, or whatever equivalent, where they were trying to in some ways protect the perpetrator, whatever it may be. Um, don't, don't cite that. Don't rebuke it. Um, not only is it false, but also even if it was accurate, um, that statistic of less than 3%, you never know if you're talking to one of those 3% and you don't want to illegitimize their circumstances by suggesting it doesn't happen very often, therefore it doesn't matter. So what do we actually want to do? We want to apply the roadmap. 
I want to say something to the effect of, you know, I agree with you that sexual assault, especially in case of incest, are among the most heinous crimes ever committed in our society. And that we need to do more to not only um, prevent that from happening, but also to punish the guilty perpetrator and to support and help that innocent victim, regardless of whether she becomes pregnant or not. I need to empathize with the fact that this is a real world um, problem that demands um, a solution addressing in multiple different capacities. I agree with you that this is a major problem in our world that demands a solution. And then I'm going to use one of two analogies. The first one I'm going to use is fits our rules. I'm going to go through this again in my Back to Basics program. We'll probably talk about this in a couple of weeks here. The three R's to making good analogies, they have to be relevant, they have to be realistic, and they have to be relatable. I'm going to dive further in depth in them in a future episode here. But um, And so I'm going to use one of two analogies. The first one I'm going to use is imagine. Imagine that a mother living in a healthy happy relationship. She's got a two-year-old child, but tragically that relationship deteriorates. Her husband loses his job, becomes an alcoholic, and begins abusing her and her child. The first thing we're going to do is get her and her child out of that abusive relationship. But imagine now when she looks at her two-year-old, she's not reminded of a loving, happy, um, supportive relationship. She is constantly reminded of an abusive partner and the older her child gets, maybe if they look more and more like her abusive partner, the more resentful, the more bitter, the more um, detached maybe she becomes from that child. Would we ever suggest that we support or help that mother by directly and intentionally killing her two-year-old because they're a constant reminder of a traumatic experience? Well, obviously not. If not a two-year-old, then why are we going to kill a pre-born child? Because they may be a constant reminder of a tra traumatic experience. We don't solve problems by killing innocent humans. What is the difference? Um, so that's the first analogy that I'm going to use. If for some reason they say, no, 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 it's different. They're already born. Um, that's whatever different. Sometimes I'll say, okay, imagine this victim that you're thinking of, this victim of sexual assault in the highest degree in, in case of incest. Imagine we can't um, intercede. Imagine we can't get involved until after the child is born. Maybe this is one of those disgusting, absolutely heinous and horrifying uh, cases in which uh, literally uh, an uncle, a parent, whatever it may be, has locked his own daughter or niece in a basement and forcibly um, impregnates her and the child is born. And then we finally break in and we release that girl and her child. There's never been any love. There's never been any positivity in this relationship. And yet now there's a two-year-old child that has been rescued along with the mother. Would we ever suggest that now that we can do something, we couldn't do something before, but now that we can do something, that we should kill that two-year-old child because of the um, depravity of the actions and, and situation? Well, absolutely not. So if we're not going to kill a born child, why would we kill a pre-born child in that scenario? If we want to empathize with the fact that, yes, this is a problem, however, we're going to demonstrate the principle by way of analogy that we don't solve these tragic and terrible circumstances by killing innocent humans, regardless of whether they're born or pre-born. Sure, there's some people that are going to connect the dots and connect that directly to, yeah, you're right, we can't kill humans to solve problems, you're right, I'm pro-life, abortion is never okay. Usually, though, what they're going to say is something to the effect of that's different, they're not human, it's just a fetus, it's just an embryo, it's just um, it's a different kettle of fish. And so in that situation, we're going to dive into the humanity. That's exactly where we want to be going. We want to be moving through the empathy towards the, the clarity component, clarifying the fact that it's a human being from the moment of fertilization, that all human beings um, receive human rights and those human rights begin when their life begins. And so we're going to press into the human rights argument. Again, I'm going to do a deep dive on this in a couple of weeks here. Um, but for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the human rights argument or want a refresher on it, it's four questions. First question, do you agree that all humans get human rights? Do you agree all humans get human rights? Yes, I agree all humans get human rights. Question two, if something is growing, isn't it alive? Something is growing even from one cell to two cells to four cells, isn't it alive? Again, the overall majority of people are going to acknowledge that, yeah, if something is growing, it must be alive. Doesn't mean it's valuable. Doesn't mean it's human. 
you might get, but it's what about trees? What about grass? What about animals? Do you eat eggs? All that kind of stuff. That's where you need to press right into question three. Don't take the bait. Don't explain how eggs that you buy at the grocery store are not fertilized. Don't get into the fact that cutting your grass doesn't kill your grass or anything like that. Don't take the bait on getting sidetracked from the human rights argument. Press straight into question three which is if that living organism has human parents, isn't he or she a living human? We know what species that organism belongs to simply by looking at the parents. You don't have to be able to discern it from looking at their genetic code because neither you nor I could probably decipher a genetic code and identify them to be a human versus any other species. We don't even have to be able to look at a single cell zygote through a microscope and be able to tell the difference between it and a chicken zygote or a dog zygote or anything else. We don't have to have that kind of visual expertise. We need to have the very simple biological principle that organisms reproduce to have kind of their own species. If something, um, if that living organism has human parents, isn't he or she, we're going to steep this in value centric language, he or she, a living member of the human family. And fourth, and finally tying it all together, wouldn't that make abortion a human rights violation? So four questions, get through the human rights argument. This is where the majority of people end up shifting in their worldview on abortion. Thinking about abortion from a whole different vantage point and realizing that we're, we're dealing with two humans here. Um, that's where a lot of people end up shifting um, if they need further clarification. If they say, you pro-lifers, you crafty folks, you have come up with these four beautifully worded questions that trick people into becoming pro-life because they don't know how to talk around it but no, abortion doesn't kill an innocent human. You are somehow fabricating the results. What is arguably the best way of convincing somebody that abortion kills an innocent human being? Show them that abortion kills an innocent human being. You're going to show them the visual reality of what abortion does to the weakest, most vulnerable member of our human family. We have images showing late-term abortions, second trimester abortions, first trimester abortions. We have um, children who have been killed through the abortion pill. Um, each of which demonstrate the humanity of preborn children and the horrors of what abortion does to them, both the who and the what of abortion. If necessary, if they say, okay, fine, I give it to you that um, this is technically a living member of the human species, but no, I'm going to renege on the first question of your human rights argument that no, not all human beings actually get human rights. I'm going to go towards, okay, um, what is the difference? What, what is the difference between a human who does get human rights and a human who doesn't? And often they'll bring up something like sentience or awareness or independence or viability or something like that. Um, and at this point, I just ask the question, why? I just ask, why does that difference exist? Why does that difference exist? Why does that difference exist? And it always roots back down to how old they are. A preborn child is not able to survive outside of the mother's womb on their own because of how old they are. They don't have a fully rational brain because of how old they are. They're not um, aware of their surroundings because of how old they are. They may not even have arms and legs. They might not look like you or I because of how old they are. And so I'll say um, something to the effect of help me understand why discriminating human rights based on age would be any better than discriminating human rights based on any other arbitrary attribute. Imagine if we discriminated human rights based on somebody's skin color, or imagine we discriminated human rights based on somebody's gender or uh, religious affiliation or ethnicity. How is age-based discrimination any better than any of those other forms of discrimination, particularly those in which um, the discriminated against party has no control over them? And so I want to challenge them by demonstrating that those who support abortion are actually on the side of discrimination and not on the side of equality, not on the side of equal human rights, not on the side of um, yeah, e equality, that this is age-based or at times ability-based discrimination. You might need to cycle through those different stages. If they say at that point, oh, well, we, we got to go back to incest and rape. Okay, you're going to go through the same model over again. And so that that's the first one. I'm going to blast to the second two a little bit quicker because it's a very similar model, especially once you get through the common ground analogy in question. So that first category of abortion um, advocacy pertains to um, empathy towards the mother. 
And at times pro-lifers respond with frustration or with um, callousness because we view this as a very selfish kind of argument. What happens, though, if the argument in favor of abortion has a surface level or quasi-compassion and empathy for the child? Sometimes pro-lifers respond to that by being confused. And what I mean by this is arguments along the lines of, what about the well-being and quality of life of the child? What if we know that child is going to end up in foster care? What if we know that child is going to end up on drugs? What if that child has been diagnosed with a disability? Don't you care enough about the child to spare them the misery, the suffering, the pain of enduring that life and rather the compassion option of taking them out of that misery and releasing them from that pain and suffering? And I mention this not because it's different, but because pro-lifers at times respond differently. Sometimes pro-lifers respond with confusion because they feel as though they are now the callous ones. They are now the selfish ones who are clinging to a principle that doesn't allow for the alleviation of pain and suffering. Now they're worried that they are actually the, um, the oppressive ones and no longer the ones who care about the welfare of human beings, which is weird because that's not the case at all. And so in these situations, rather than backtracking, rather than trying to justify just how much you care about preborn children or offering arguments which aren't going to hit home, sometimes I hear arguments, uh, let's tackle one along the lines of disability. I'm sure many people have heard and, and I hope are horrified by the fact that in places around the world, including here in Canada where I live, um, that there's an overwhelming number of children who are diagnosed with Down syndrome uh, prenatally who are aborted because of that. And I've heard pro-lifers respond by saying, oh, but one of two things. They're going to refute one of two things. First of all, saying my child was diagnosed with Down syndrome and we chose life and he never had Down syndrome. And so you shouldn't have an abortion because those tests aren't always correct. I get what you're trying to get at, but it doesn't work because often those tests are correct. Sure, I know lots of people who have told me this exact story. They're, they're not infallible tests, but even if they were, it doesn't change abortion, right? Abortion is not wrong when a child has been diagnosed or, or suggested to have had Down syndrome because they could not have a, um, Down syndrome. Because that implies that if they did have Down syndrome, that it would be okay to abort them. No, abortion is not okay regardless of whether they have Down syndrome or not, regardless of whether we get false positives or false negatives in our um, prenatal testing. Second ref refutation that I want to address and reject is the fact that, oh, well, children with Down syndrome are incredibly happy. You're telling me that they have low quality of life. They love their life far more than most other people. And... I, I'm not a psychologist. I don't have the stats on how many children with Down syndrome report higher quality of life than other people. All I want to say is that that certainly isn't the case for all disabilities. And I know very well that there are some children with um, Down syndrome who go through incredibly challenging parts of their life, whether it's a day-to-day -day thing, whether it's a week-to-week -week thing, whether um, they're struggling with the same self-esteem and um, self-awareness that anybody else is there's tremendous suffering in everybody's life, right? And there are some conditions in which that suffering is even more elevated and there's no way that we can dance around the fact that they are gonna suffer. And so rather than trying to skirt around the issue, we need to tackle it head on with the exact same roadmap, all right? I agree with you that um, tragically, children are diagnosed with all kinds of different ailments, diseases, conditions, whatever it may be, which may result in a very high degree of pain and suffering. There's a problem. I'm going to empathize with the fact that there's a problem in our fallen world that there is a tremendous amount of pain and suffering that demands some form or multiple forms of response. I'm going to make an analogy that demonstrates the principle that even in light of that, we don't kill humans to solve that problem. Imagine that a born child, maybe a two-year-old, was tragically um, injured in a car accident and lost the use of their legs or um, was burned very severely and had disfigurement or whatever. Imagine there's a two-year-old who was severely impacted by a condition or illness. Would we ever suggest that the way to help that child would be to kill them rather than to mitigate and manage their pain and therefore alleviate and address as much of their suffering as possible? 
if not a born child, why a preborn child? If they push back and say, yes, we should be killing the two-year-old child, then you can do one of two things. You can test a limit. You can say, okay, well, what if that wasn't a two-year-old, but rather a 14-year-old? What it, like, where's the limit? Are there any people that you don't feel comfortable killing if they have um, either a disability or a disease or a condition? Is there anybody who gets suicide prevention? And not to get too deep into this, but there's a massive difference. I would argue, obviously, that suicide is not appropriate anyways, but we would have to at the very least argue that there's a massive difference between somebody choosing death for themselves and us imposing death upon somebody else, particularly upon somebody else who has no control over the situation. That while I deeply believe that we should be... um, fighting as hard as humanly possible against assisted suicide and euthanasia. We're going to have Alex Schadenberg on um, two weeks from now, I believe, uh, to talk a little bit about that um, from the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of Canada. However, um, at the very least, we should be able to acknowledge that there's a massive difference between somebody pulling the plug on themselves and somebody running through a hospital pulling the plug on other people whose lives they don't deem to be valuable or worth sustaining. And so, again, majority of people are going to say, no, we can't intentionally kill born humans to solve these problems. And then at that point, you're going to dive back into the humanity and then, if necessary, the person. Last one that I'm going to get into. Um, and so the first kind of scenario is empathy towards the mother. The second kind of scenario is shallow level empathy towards the child. The third kind of scenario is what uh, my colleague Quanta calls position statements. This is bodily autonomy. This is something like overpopulation or uh, population control or uh, massive societal problems that somebody is suggesting, you know what, if we're going to live in a holistic, big problem, big solution kind of society, there are going to be individuals that are arguably collateral damage. Um Overpopulation, you know what? We we have too many mouths to feed already, and so somebody has to go without. Therefore, why not have the people that can't, who don't know that they're going without, go without? Or bodily autonomy, my right to control my body extends even to the extent of being able to harm other people. These position statements feel like they present problems that are above our pay grade, um, to quote um Unfortunately, Barack Obama, in an interview that he had with a pastor while they were talking about abortion, that um, he said that the question of when human life begins was above his pay grade as president of the United States. Um, And so a little random (laughs) anecdote there. Sorry about that. Um, That we feel as though we can't actually solve the problems of our world, our problems of our economy, of our social imbalance, our whatever system, that system, bodily autonomy. We don't have the ability to address these adequately. Therefore, they should be um, avoided if at all possible. Um, And then I find that in these cases, we end up pleading that, yes, that's a problem. No, I don't know how to fix it. But isn't this a baby? But isn't this a baby? Again, tragically not going incredibly far that direction. In these cases, again, we want to build common ground, make an analogy, ask a question, and then move through the rest of our roadmap. I agree with you that bodily autonomy is an incredibly important um, right and privilege that we have as Canadians, as people around the world, um, and that it's wildly inappropriate to strip that right in the vast majority of cases. Imagine there was somebody who wanted to use their body to directly and intentionally harm a born child. You can get into specifics or you can leave it very general like that. Imagine there was somebody who wanted to use their body or make a decision about their body, which would intentionally and directly harm a born child. Whether this is child abuse, whether it's um, um, physical abuse, whether it's neglect, whether it's anything like that, make decisions about their body, which will directly and intentionally harm a born child. Should they be allowed to do that? If not a born child, if we can't use our bodies or make decisions about our bodies, which will directly and intentionally harm a born child, then why can we use our bodies or make decisions about our bodies, which will directly and intentionally harm a pre-born child? Um, Don't take the bait on this one. They might want to jump directly towards personhood. They might say, okay, I grant that they're human. However, they don't get the right to my body. That's not enough. You need further confirmation that they are human. And so you still need to get through the human rights argument. I don't think that you should ever go through a conversation without talking through the human rights argument. If it only takes 30 seconds and they nod along and they say, yes, 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 I agree with you. This is totally a human being. I get it. However, 
they can't survive on their own or they are um, dependent on the mother's body or whatever, um, you still have to get through the human rights argument to make sure that you're not taking a shortcut that's going to come back and bite you in the behind later on. Because the last thing that you want is to spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour talking about the personhood of preborn children and then have them say, okay, but it's not even a human. It's just a fetus. Oh my goodness. I just beat my head against the brick wall for 30 minutes because I hadn't actually gotten them to agree that this is a living member of the human species. And if they're not a living member of the human species, then why would they get human rights? Um, and so you still got to press through the human rights argument. You still go through, um, if necessary, especially in this case, um, the human plus X. Why are they completely dependent on the mother's body? Why are they um, needing the mother's body in the way that they are? It's because of how old they are. So how is age-based discrimination any different or any better than any other form of discrimination? I hope that makes sense. As I mentioned, I'm going to have my colleague Quanta join me on the show to talk through them, to give a little bit more of a realistic kind of back and forth on them. But I hope that clarifies a little bit as to how this roadmap of empathy through common ground analogy question, clarity through the humanity, the four questions of the human rights argument, and um, kind of the value component with personhood, human plus X, and age-based discrimination can help draw people towards the, um, the pro-life worldview. Again, don't take shortcuts. They don't pay off. You might get um, fortunate a time or two. However, so often it is important that you first of all anchor in their minds that you care. The reason why we start with with um, common ground knowledge question is to demonstrate the fact that you care about them, about mothers going through hard situations, about children who may experience poor quality of life, about our world. You care. Building on that, that you understand how this is dictated by the humanity of preborn children and that you tremendously value preborn children in the same way that you value born humans. This isn't taking away from born humans, but rather elevating all humans to the same capacity, in often um, cases, elevating them far higher than the person you're talking to has ever considered them to be valued um, in the first place. And so you need them to understand that you care before you can help them understand um, the humanity of those preborn children. I hope that makes sense. Um, please shoot me an email at email at prolifeguys.com if you have any questions or, or want to clarify anything on that. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. Um, again, check out other content. Subscribe. Please, please, please subscribe, especially on YouTube. Quick shout out on YouTube. I get that many of you are listening on your favorite podcatcher, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcast, um, Google Podcast, whatever it may be. The reason why I'd love for you to subscribe to the YouTube channel largely is because the YouTube channel is one of the few resources that people can gauge following, understand how big the show is. And while I understand the majority of people aren't on YouTube, when I'm trying to invite a guest onto the show, it's difficult to, for them to understand just how worthwhile their time would be if they don't know how big the show is, that a high profile guest might say, you know what, I, I really appreciate this person reaching out to me, but my time is better spent elsewhere where I can reach more people or impact um, a greater number. By subscribing to the YouTube channel, you show them in a very visible way because everyone can see how many subscribers there are. Everyone can see how many people watch the videos, like the videos, comment on the videos. And they can say, huh, this guy actually has a relatively large following. This is worth my time because there's a thousand, several thousand subscribers to the YouTube channel and they're actively engaged and involved and might actually get involved with my ministry. And so that's my shout out. Thanks a ton for tuning in. May God bless you abundantly wherever you're at, however many hours are left in your day.